I now call to order the Society's 2,437th meeting in the 150th year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PSW Science's Spring 2021 meeting and lecture series. Because of COVID-19, the Society is bringing this meeting to you via Zoom from locations all around the globe, rather than our usual home, the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. This evening's lecture will be about the Clipper mission to Jupiter's icy moon Europa. Our speaker is Kate Kraft, staff scientist at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory and staff scientist on the Europa Clipper mission. I'm Larry Milstein, president and program director of PSW Science. One of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, founded in 1871 as the Philosophical Society of Washington to provide a forum to exchange scientific ideas, further scientific understanding and encourage scientific inquiry. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the PSW Science YouTube channel where I'll join 150 other recordings of PSW Science lectures. We invite you to explore these presentations and to become a member through the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. Last Saturday, was the 150th anniversary of the Society's founding on March 13, 1871. Because of COVID restrictions, we could not gather all the members together to celebrate the occasion. But members of the General Committee commemorated the anniversary day on the National Mall at the statue of Joseph Henry in front of the Smithsonian Castle where the society was formally founded. We recited some of the society's history and toasted the founders, the members, the society and its future. We raised our glasses on behalf of all PSW members to celebrate the society's first 150 years and to wish the society even better fortune and success in the next 150 years. We are all looking forward to celebrating the society's first 150 years in person together sometime this year when we are able once again to meet in person. We will keep you posted on these plans as they become clear. In the meantime, please join me in toasting the society's 150th year. To the society, its members, speakers, and long legacy of promoting science and the exchange of scientific ideas. The Society is grateful for the sponsorships of the 2021 lecture series by the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and by a generous donor who asked to remain unnamed. We thank all of our sponsors. Before we turn to the lecture, in keeping with the society's traditions, we will welcome new members and read the minutes of the previous meeting and the summary of the previous meeting's lecture. I am pleased to announce the following members have been elected to the society. Roger Mann, a mobile app developer interested in software design, quantum mechanics, astrophysics, and Europa, who learned of PSW some time ago and has been watching videos of previous PSW meetings. Eric Enig, an engineer with Enig Associates, interested in magnetohydrodynamics and electromagnetics. Eric is a returning PSW member who learned of PSW 
from his father, longtime PS, I'm sorry, and mother, longtime PSW members, Juliet and Mary Enig, who were both presidents of the society. And Kate Kraft, our speaker tonight, who learned of PSW through our invitation to her to speak tonight. Some of her interests will be clear from tonight's lecture. We welcome them all. Those of you who are not members, please note membership is a most important pillar of the society. I encourage everyone with an interest in science to become a member. It's easy to do using the PSW Science website homepage, www.pswscience.org. PSW is a 501c3 charitable education and professional organization. Dues, payments, and other donations to PSW Science are tax deductible. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2436th meeting and the lecture by Jim Fanson on building the giant Magellan telescope. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. On March 5th, 2021, by Zoom video conference broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2436th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. The recording secretary then read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, James Fanson, project manager for the Giant Magellan Telescope. His lecture was titled, Building the Giant Magellan Telescope. The human eye has an aperture of approximately 0.2 centimeters squared and requires assistance to see further than the Andromeda galaxy, approximately 2.5 million light years away. Since Galileo's telescope in 1609, the aperture diameter of telescopes has doubled approximately every 30 years. Galileo used a 2.6 centimeter lens in his telescope. Almost 300 years later, in 1897, the Yerkes telescope reached the practical limits of refracting telescopes with its one meter lens. The next generation of telescopes used mirrors to better focus light and improve image resolution at further distances. Built in 1934, the Palomar telescope reached the mirror size limit at five meters. In 1990, the Keck telescope broke that barrier with its 10 meter segmented mirror. Now that it has been 31 years since the, the Keck telescope, Fanson said it is time for the next doubling in telescope aperture. The giant Magellan telescope or GMT, the 30 meter telescope and the European extremely large telescope are all underway to achieve that feat. The GMT will have a segmented mirror with computer control. The primary mirror will be composed of seven individual mirror segments, each 8.4 meters in diameter. Computer control will allow the GMT to maximize image resolution by phasing the seven mirror segments and correcting for atmospheric distortions with adaptive optics. Fanson said these advancements will allow the GMT to get near the level of imaging resolution that has so far only been available from space-based telescopes. The GMT will be constructed at the Las Campanas Observatory site at the southern end of the Atacama Desert in Chile. The remote mountaintop location means it has minimal light pollution, few clouds, and dry, steady air. The GMT will be housed in an enclosure roughly the size of a football field, with its operating machinery located in a separate building. Fanson showed an animation that gave viewers a tour of the completed telescope, highlighting its mechanical functions. Most modern telescopes are reflecting telescopes with primary and secondary mirrors. In the GMT, both the primary and secondary mirrors will be segmented, operating in pairs arranged in the Gregorian optical design. These features together will be the first of their kind. Fanson then showed and described the process by which the mirrors are created using 20 tons of E6 borosilicate melted in a spinning furnace. Five of the seven primary mirror segments have so far been cast and polished to a position of approximately one millionth of an inch. Once the mirrors arrive at their destination in Chile, 
it will receive a 200 nanometer thick aluminum coating and will be installed on the telescope structure. Each mirror will be affixed by 165 pneumatic actuators. GMT will phase the primary mirror segments by using the light from a guide star reflected off the adjacent edges of adjacent segments. Based on those dispersed reflections, GMT will identify the misalignment of the edges by the degree to which the interference fringes have rotated. A prototype of the phasing system has been in use on the Magellan Clay Telescope at the Las Campanas site. Benson then described the history of adaptive optics, first proposed by Horace Babcock in 1953, by which scientists can compensate for atmospheric distortion with actuators that can restore the reflected light to their original wavelength. Adaptive optics on the GMT will be accomplished by its segmented secondary mirror. Each segment will contain 672 actuators operating at two kilohertz bandwidth, allowing real wavefront refraction correction in real time. Once completed, GMT will have 11 instrument stations. Among them will be GCLEF, an optical Lachelle instrument that scientists will use to detect exoplanets and two visible light spectrographs that can be fiber fed to widen their field of view. Benson described the engineering techniques GMT will use to protect it from seismic activity and wind vibrations. He then described the current state of construction and operations. He then concluded by answering questions from the online viewing audience. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.56 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting. The temperature in Washington, D.C., 4.5 degrees Celsius. Weather, clear. Number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 118, and views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 393 respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor at correspondingsec at pswscience.org. A video of the lecture is available for anyone without charge on the PSW Science YouTube channel, the PSW Science Vimeo channel, and can be accessed directly from the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. We now turn to tonight's lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Kate Kraft. Kate is staff scientist and the Space Exploration Group at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Previously, she was an aerospace engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. A main focus of her work is developing NASA's Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter's icy moon Europa to investigate its geology, its geological activity, and its habitability Kate is also working on several other projects for future landed and subsurface ocean world exploration missions, including a future landed mission on Europa. She is the principal investigator of a project to develop the communication technologies for future submersible cryobots. And she is working on microfluidic sample preparation devices for in situ purification and detection of chemical biosignatures, such as DNA, RNA, and amino acids. In addition to other honors and awards, Kate is the recipient of the JHU APL Heart Development Award, numerous APL IRAD awards for microfluidic sample preparation, a JHU APL Oscar Peer Award, and she was selected as Lewis and Clark Field Scholar in Astrobiology. In addition, she was one of 50 finalists out of 18,000 applicants in the 2017 NASA astronaut selection process. 
Kate earned a BS in aerospace engineering at Virginia Tech, an MS in aerospace engineering at the University of Maryland and an MS in geophysics at the Georgia Institute of Technology and a PhD in geophysics at Virginia Tech. All questions would be fielded in the Q&A session after the lecture. Kate, the screen is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here this evening, I'm getting to speak to you about this next uh, super exciting flagship mission that NASA will be sending to the icy moon Europa with an overall overarching goal to explore its habitability. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, again, I'm Kate Kraft and I'm a, a planetary scientist at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Okay, so um, Europa is one of the Galilean satellites of Jupiter. The Galileo spacecraft explored these moons uh, from about 1995 to 2003, and it explored these moons as it did multiple orbits around the bodies there. Europa here is the second in the order um, as you um, move outwards uh, in the orbital plane um, from Jupiter. Io is an in the innermost Galilean moon. It's very uh, active, very volcanically active and spews out sulfur as its um, volcanoes um, go off. And um, some of that material gets deposited on the surface of Europa. Um, Europa itself is an icy moon. The whole surface of Europa is made of, of water ice. And then as you go further out, you get to the little bit larger moons, um, Ganymede and Callisto, which are also icy ocean worlds. However, their ice shells um, are much more cratered and uh, much thicker. The ice shell um, to ocean uh, ratio is much higher. So one of the really exciting things about the Jupiter system is that Jupiter has a really strong magnetic field. And as it uh, throws out these magnetic um, forces in, in these fields, it can induce um, mag magnetism and a magnetic field in the other bodies around it. And so what was detected by the Galileo um, spacecraft was an induced magnetic field at Europa. And this is really what indicates to us that there is an ocean beneath the surface of Europa that's a salty um, ocean, it's a fluid that is conductive and uh, can induce a magnetic field at Europa. And um, we know it's a salty conductive material and it's a fluid material. And that's why we get this induced magnetic field. And um, this, this effort's been um, being led on the Clipper mission um, by um, the folks up here on the upper left. And the um, graph here that's being shown in the upper right uh, can indicate to us how we can learn about um, a moon and its uh, induced magnetic field, uh, looking at the field uh, strengths and how that relates to um, the ocean depth and also the conductivity. So we can learn a lot about the interior of these moons um, using this magnetic field measurements. So as Europa orbits around Jupiter, it's being pulled and tugged on. So Europa's orbit around Jupiter is not completely circular. It's actually slightly elliptical. And so that means some of the time it's a little bit closer to Jupiter, some of the time it's a little bit further away. And when this happens, as it goes around in this orbit, it's being pulled and tugged on and it's being flexed. And so when it's being flexed, it actually causes some heating to be induced both in the interior region and the rocky uh, interior um, and also in the ice shell. And so you can see here what we believe is happening with the tidal heating that's being induced in the, in the inner regions of, of Europa. And the structure of Europa is such that it has an iron core at the center, it has a rocky mantle, and it has an ocean and an ice shell. Now, when you look at this um, ratio of these different materials in this, in this small moon, and Europa is about the size of our moon, so it gives you some perspective on, these, on these, the size of this moon, um, it is, um, looks like the ocean's not really that thick, but really this ocean, we believe, is about 100 kilometers deep. Uh, and so a very, very deep ocean with, a, with an outer ice shell that we think is in the range of a few tens of kilometers thick. So the ocean in Europa is about 100 kilometers thick. And we think about the, the small moon Europa being about the size of our moon. And so we thought, oh, you know, there's not probably really that much water there. But when you combine the amount of water that's in that thick um, ocean um, around the inside of Europa with the water that's available on the surface of the Earth. So if we combined all the water from the oceans, the rivers, the lakes on the Earth, and we made it into a sphere, and we compare that to the amount of water at Europa, Europa 
actually has almost two times more water than all the surface water on the earth. So it's a fantastic amount of water, water everywhere, right? As in the form of liquid, as well as ice. We also think that due to that tidal forcing, that tidal heating, it could be inducing hydrothermal activity at the seafloor. So this hydrothermal activity is, is inducing chemistry and nutrients into the ocean. And it's also enabling that ocean to survive and to, to persist for long periods of time. You know, probably by now Europa would have been just an ice ball if it had not been for this, this tidal forcing going on and enabling that ocean to stay at a temperature that can um, allow it to stay a fluid. We also think that this, this um, heating and this, this um, circulation that's potentially being induced in the ocean can allow the, the flexing at the, uh, the ice shell to, to cause fractures and potentially enabling pathways for the fluid to make its way through the ice crust out into space, maybe as plumes or as um, eruptions onto the surface and flows on the surface, such as cryolavas. And we also think there's regions we call diapirs, where it's a, a warm, like slushy, more slushy type of material that over time oozes its way in a way up towards the surface and causes surface features to form on the surface of Europa. And what's really exciting about thinking about hydrothermal activity is when we look at the hydrothermal systems on our seafloor, back in the 70s, really not too long ago, right, we only just discovered these systems at our seafloor, where the, the warm magma near the seafloor is inducing seawater to circulate, bring chemistry up to the, to the ocean water, and form these chimneys, these black smokers. And here we see life. Here we discovered life that only has to live off the chemistry at the seafloor. It does not have to have light. We, you know, we used to think that all life needed light, sunlight. But now, you know, this really opens up the world of possibility for what other worlds might be able to harbor life. If these icy ocean worlds that are that are not open to the sunlight above can potentially harbor. Uh, life down here that can just live off the chemistry, you know, this really opens up um, just so much more potential for life in our own solar system. So when we look at Europa's surface, um, it's a cold icy moon. It's about 100 Kelvin at the surface, and um, which is about uh, negative 173 Celsius, um, really cold at the surface, heavily irradiated from Jupiter's strong magnetic field. Um, we see all kinds of really interesting features. We see reddish material that's a composition that's a com com combination of salts and sulfur that's been deposited from Io and irradiated over time. We see structures, long linear ridges. Um, you can see over here the ridged plains where we see these features that are called double ridges, which look somewhat like the double ridges on our seafloor where the new magma is coming up. But here it could be like a long linear fracture traveling for thousands of kilometers, some of them do. And um, these raised ridges on either side. We see fantastic regions called chaos terrain, where um, these blocks are jumbled and have been turned onto their side. They've broken. You can see um, remains of the ridges that used to crisscross across their surface. Um, this is indica indicative potentially of uh, near subsurface water. We do see a few craters, but actually the, the interesting thing about not seeing that many craters really indicates to us that Europa's surface is very young. Um, it, most of the other moons, as I mentioned, um, uh, Ganymede and Callisto, they're very heavily cratered, which means they're an older surface. And so Europa's surface is theorized to be about 50 million years old, so really geologically young. We also see these really interesting little spots on Europa, which are called lenticulae, and um, we like to call them freckles on the surface of Europa. And these are, some of them are domes and some of them are um, pits. And so we're not really sure how they formed. Maybe they're warmer material that's come up near the surface or potentially even uh, cryolava flows. So here we're gonna zoom in on a double ridge on Europa and just get the perspective you might get if you were on a spacecraft flying in to investigate and get a closer look. And so you can see how in the middle there's this uh, fracture that's, that's running along the middle with these raised double ridges on either side. Many other fractures, previous fractures that are crisscrossing all along, um, running alongside. Um, in some of the double ridges, we see flanking subparallel fractures that may indicate a near, nearer thermal anomaly, nearer the surface that's allowed flexuring of the surface to occur. 
Another really interesting feature that we see on the surface of Europa are called bands. So these are regions on the surface that are smoother, that may have some ridging going on, multiple ridging um, along in their surface, but they're, they're regions at the surface that have been theorized to have been formed by warm material. As the surface maybe has spread apart, this warmer convection that may be happening deeper down in the ice shell is allowed to bring this warmer material up towards the surface and form these areas we call bands. We also see regions that have been termed subsumption zones. And so these are areas where actually we see, um, whereas bands have brought up potentially new material, we see regions of the surface that may uh, be missing. And so this indicates that some of the um, material may be actually sub being subsumed into the, the cold uh, ice shell beneath. And so it's somewhat uh, similar to on Earth where we have subduction zones, where uh, plates are moving across on top of one another, um, some of the materials being pushed downwards um, beneath the upper uh, shell. And then speaking a little bit about the, the um, craters that we see on Europa are that we see um, some larger features which are multi-ringed crater basins. Um, here is Tyre and the above one is Kalanish. And we also see smaller features that have some of the material within the, in the center that's been raised, um, the raised center uh, point of a, of a crater. And then some are barely even, you're barely even able to see evidence of where they um, entered uh, the ice shell. And this can help us learn a lot about um, the ice, cell, ice shell structure at these locations. And then, of course, uh, we want to study the composition of Europa. You know, currently what we know about Europa um, is that there's salts on the surface. Many of them have been irradiated. There's a lot of lab experiments that people are doing to irradiate different kinds of salts to try to understand what the colors can tell us about um, what we observe on the surface of Europa, what that might indicate for different compositions. And it's really exciting to see evidence of salts because that means there's potential that this ocean material has come to the surface and, and, and um, deposited on the surface. We also see evidence of, of sulfuric acid and sulfur. So the sulfur coming from Io and being deposited is being irradiated and maybe turning into sulfuric acid, which could potentially um, pose some challenges for future, future mission, missions that are um, trying to study and sample there. Again, ice shell convection may be a source of bringing material towards the surface. So if you can remember back in the day when we had lava lamps around and how the material flows upwards, and that's a, that's a heat motion of being in uh, density difference. As you warm things up, they, they will move around and change places with, due to the density. And uh, so these, this convection may be happening deep down in the ice shell and maybe allowing material to, to flow and move around and potentially could be a source of um, uh, mechanism to bring a material to the surface at these freckle uh, pits and, and domes locations on the surface. And then again, the chaos terrains. The chaos terrains, um, there's one here, Connemara and Thera up here in the upper right. And these are just regions of jumbled material, uh, material that has somehow been allowed to move around, uh, turn on its side, flip over. And we see these kinds of um, similar types of features in, in the polar regions on Earth where the, the Arctic and the ice shell has been allowed to break off, pieces break off and they get all jumbled and move around. And this really can be indicative of near uh, surface uh, water beneath of those ice blocks that allow them that motion to be able to move and turn around. So this has been theorized to be a potential um, source for um, allowing this material at the surface to move around. And so these, of course, are one of the, the places that um, Clipper, we hope to uh, make great observations at hoping to find evidence of near subsurface water. There are also some of the younger features on, on the surface. And then, of course, plumes. Plumes are, are really exciting for many reasons, but one is that potentially that's material that's coming directly from the ocean, right? If we're able to um, arrive at Europa and see plumes happening and we fly through them, we'll, we'll be able to you know, sniff and smell and taste the, the potentially directly the ocean of Europa. And so we're not sure. There's been some observations that are, that are intriguing um, of potential evidence for plumes. They haven't been repeatable or, or observed again um, in these locations of Europa's orbit to where we would expect maybe to see them if they were um, somehow driven by a periodic process. Um, but still, we, we um, are very intrigued about looking for these um, with our mission and hope to, to see some. 
So with all of that, you know, Europa is this exciting, exciting world, but really to understand, you know, if, is it habitable? Does it have the ingredients that can support life? We need to, to study certain things about it. We need to really understand the water, you know, how much is there, how salty is the water? Um, uh, you know, we can use the magnetic measurements and thermal models to, to help tell us about that. Um, and um, the uh, possible lakes within the ice shell, are there places where maybe the water doesn't get all the way to the surface, but it gets near to the surface? Um, the chemistry of this world is the ocean in direct contact with mantle rock, which would allow it to promote this chemical leaching, bringing chemistry from the rock uh, into the ocean. The dark red surface materials on the on the surface of Europa, what exactly are those? You know, what salts are, are present? Um, are they from the ocean? The energy that's available. Um, life needs energy. The chemical energy that could be supplied by the hydrothermal systems that could sustain life. Um, surface irradiation actually helps. So in this environment where it's heavily irradiated, life doesn't want to hang out on the surface. You know, that's a really a bad place for life to be. But, but the process that it's undergoing of the materials at the surface can produce oxidants. And then in combination with the, the reductants that may be being produced by the hydrothermal systems, if they're allowed to mix the oxidants and reductants, that really provides an environment of which is conducive for life. So Europa Clipper um, will go and investigate Europa for all of these reasons. Overarching is the goal of really understanding and being able to characterize its habitability. It'll do this through uh, certain science objectives. We want to study the ice shell and ocean. We wanna characterize those areas, really understand how much subsurface water is there. Is there any in the ice shell? Uh, understand the ocean properties, its salinity and conductivity. Uh, what is the nature of any surface to ice to ocean exchange? You know, is there any exchange processes going on or are they fairly separated? Composition, understanding um, habitability requires us to understand what materials are there, what kind of food is there for life to eat, um, and the exchanges um, there as well with the different compositions and how that could provide the right chemistry and environment for life. And then studying the geology, understanding how those geologic features form really helps us understand how Europa works, like what are the mechanisms that are occurring and um, can help characterize for us what sites, if we wanna land there in the future, what sites really are the most scientifically interesting? Where is the water really the closest to the surface that we might um, potentially sample it? And so part of Clipper's mission is to um, also, you know, seek out sites of high science interest and also safe landing sites for a future lander. And any recent activity, if we can see evidence of plumes, if we see evidence of, of changes on the surface between flybys or between what Galileo data had um, has images of previously and compare it to what uh, Clipper gets and we can see if there's any evidence of recent activity. So the suite of instruments on the Clipper mission include all that you see here. We have um, a couple groups of remote, sense, remote sensing instruments as well as in situ. And the remote sensing instruments are the ones in blue, circled in blue, and the in situ are circled in gold. And so I'll just um, speak quickly through the different ones that we have. And the first one here is mass specs. It's a mass spectrometer being led by Jim Burtz at the Southwest Research Institute. It'll sniff the atmospheric composition. We have a SUDA dust, uh, dust analyzer being led by Sasha Kempf at the University of Colorado, and it will detect surface and plume composition. The uh, Europa Clipper magnetometer being led by Margaret Kivelson of the University of Michigan, which will go after revealing the ocean properties. The PIMS instrument is a plasma instrument uh, that uses Faraday cups and is being led by Joe Westlake out of the Applied Physics Lab. It'll measure, measure the plasma environment. And then the um, gravity and radio science is the other in situ instrument, which will use um, Doppler gravity measurements uh, to interrogate the ice shell and overall moon structure. And it's being led by Erwin uh, Mazariko out of the Goddard Space Flight Center. And then we have remote sensing instruments. So the Europa ultraviolet spectrometer is being led by Kurt Rutherford at the Southwest Research Institute, and it'll seek plume glow. And I'll speak more in detail to all of these in the, the following slides. Um, but the ICE um, is the Europa Imaging System includes actually two cameras, a narrow angle and a wide angle camera. And that's being led by Zibby Turtle out of the Applied Physics Lab. Um, and it will map, it'll take, do all the imaging of the surface of Europa. 
The MISE instrument is an infrared spectrometer being led by Diana Blaney out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It'll detect um, chemical fingerprints and the composition at the surface. The eThemus in instrument is a thermal imager being led by Phil Christensen out of Arizona State University, and it'll search for hot spots. So really give us a good idea of if there's any liquid water coming near to the surface. And then Reason is an ice penetrating radar. This really interesting instrument is going to be able to interrogate the ice shell, look for water pockets, tell us where that ice ocean interface is. And that instrument's being led by Don Blankenship out of the University of Texas Institute of Geophysics. So I'm going to start um, by going through our remote sensing investigations. So again, I'm talking a little bit about what we already know about Europa plumes. Um, we've had several independent methods of detection that point to the existence or the potential existence of plumes at Europa. We've had ultraviolet and thermal imaging, radio occultations, magnetic perturbation measurements. So there's been several studies that are listed here. Roth et al. in 2014 took some line, line emission um, measurements and looked at dissociation products of water. The Sparks et al. Um, uh, study looked at off-limb continuum absorption as Europa transited Jupiter. And the Ja et al. looked back at Galileo data and the ionized plume particles that were interacting with the incident plasma, causing slowdown uh, and flow diversion of the magnetic field. And so um, these are ways that we've been searching for um, plumes at Europa. Um, a lot of these measurements have sort of been at the very edge of the measurement capabilities, and that's um, some of why we're only calling them putative observations, not yet confirmed, um, but we're looking very much uh, forward to confirming those uh, with Europa Clipper and further uh, searching for plumes. And one of the instruments that will uh, achieve this is the Europa Ultraviolet Spectrograph, and it's the Europa UVS instrument. Uh, it will seek to interrogate and characterize the atmosphere. It'll look for plumes. It'll search on the surface for the composition and microphysics and, relation, and relate those to what's happening endogenically versus exogenically. So what's happening at Europa or coming from Europa and what's coming uh, from outside. It'll also interrogate and investigate the plasma environment. It'll investigate energy and mass flow into Europa's atmosphere and neutral cloud and plasma torus. It'll do all this through spatial and spectral UV imaging. Um, the high spatial resolution mode allows for imaging of the detailed surface and plume structures, and it'll perform solar and stellar occultations to determine composition. So this is where it looks from far away and it looks as Europa uh, transit past uh, certain stars, and it'll use that to look um, for this information. And we're in the phase right now that Europa is in, we're actually starting to put CAD drawings, you know, engineering drawings to hardware. And so it's in a very exciting time um, for the mission right now where we're actually starting to build engineering models and flight hardware, really getting ready to launch in, in only really a few years. And so um, here you can see what was originally the original design uh, for, the, for the instrument and now some hardware pieces um, that are being put together. The key instrument parameters are listed here and I won't go through all of them for the instruments, but. If we'd like to go back, we can do that later. Okay, so the Europa Imaging System is the cameras, the set of cameras that are going on Clipper, and they will help constrain the formation of surface features and potential for current activity. So they'll be looking for plumes um, as well. It'll characterize the ice shell and characterize a surface regolith at small scales. Those two instruments include the narrow angle camera or the NAC and the wide angle camera or the WAC. And the narrow angle camera gets the highest resolution. It can also do stereo imaging and in color. NAC has a gimbal. So the NAC instrument, um, contrary to most of the other instruments on the Clipper mission, can actually um, turn and look in different directions. It doesn't always have to be looking nadir as we fly by Europa. So it has this extra capability. It enables it to have some independent targeting, and it also enables to do near global mapping of the surface of Europa and also in stereo, and also do high phase observations to search for plumes. The WAC looks along track as we fly over Europa and can also do stereo and color imaging. 
WAC supports um, cross-track decluttering um, for the ice penetrating radar. So when the radar is, is doing its sounding and its reflections, it sometimes, it, you know, has to be, it, it can't tell uh, on its own if it's looking at something in the subsurface or if the reflection is coming from either side. And so the WAC um, imaging actually helps them determine whether the signal that they're receiving is coming from the subsurface or from a further distance um, to the side. Here's a, just an image that I could to, we can use to show how well the um, WAC and NAC can get um, images. So here is a region of Europa surface uh, at the uh, 10 kilometer scale bar here. And we start to zoom in using the different uh, cameras. So this uh, region here is now the WAC at color. You can zoom in on it and get color information at less than 500 meters per pixel. And then moving to the smaller uh, yellow uh, square, we zoom in with the NAC and get global mapping at less than 50 meters per pixel. And then zooming even further in on this very small region, we get um, uh, NAC high res uh, stereo and imaging at uh, half a meter per pixel at the 50 kilometer altitude. So the resolution just continues to get better and better you know, as we get closer to the surface um, on our flybys. The Europa Thermal Imaging System will also uh, uh, detect and characterize thermal anomalies that may indicate recent activities such as plumes. Um, it'll help us determine if we see evidence of plumes where those plumes may be coming from. And also it'll uh, characterize and determine the regolith particle size, any block is, blocks that are around and um, subsurface layering for future processes studies. So it's, you know, when you're trying to figure out how a geologic feature was formed, all this information is really important. And then when you think about places that you might wanna land, understanding how many boulders might be around is also very helpful for avoiding any unwanted uh, tipping over of your of your lander. Uh, so looking for regions that are more, you know, have less uh, boulders, um, the smoother regolith is would be ideal. And so this this type of information will also be very helpful to future land admissions. The instrument itself is a high has high uh, capability for high resolution thermal images. It takes images both at day and night, and that's important for understanding thermal inertia. It uses an uncooled microbolometer array with three spectral channels, and it has time delay integration for measuring uh, very low temperatures. The MISE instrument has the ability to assess um, Europa's habitability by understanding the inventory and distribution of surface compounds. So it really looks at the composition of Europa's surface. It, this also helps in understanding Europa's geologic history, and it will search for areas at the surface that are currently geologically active. So by, able, by being able to identify organics and salts, any hot spots and ices, Sorry. Um, we can uh, further understand when uh, geologic activity occurred, where its sources might be, so where that material may have been sourced from. So it's a, um, a spectrometer that um, you get reflectance data from, and you use that to understand what materials you're, you're observing. So we have, we can see uh, evidence of water ice, different types of salts, um, benzene, octane, different types of compounds. Um, and this can tell us a lot about the salt and ice chemistry, as well as making detections of trace organics. The reason instrument is the ice penetrating radar. And this instrument will characterize the distribution of any shallow subsurface water. It'll search for ice, evidence of ice ocean ex interface, um, sorry, the ice ocean interface here at the base of the ice shell. How thick is the ice shell? How thick is the ocean? It'll help us understand that. It'll also characterize the ice shell's global thermophysical structure. Um, it'll look for evidence of material exchange between the ocean, the ice shell, the surface, and the atmosphere. It'll constrain the amplitude and phase of the tides. So again, if we recall that as Europa is going around Jupiter, it's being pulled and tugged on and the tidal forcing actually can cause bulging of the surface. And so it will help identify how much bulging is occurring, which can be indicative then of how thick the ice shell is. It'll characterize scientifically compelling sites and hazards for a future, poten uh, future potential land admission. And um, so the reason instrument uses two different frequencies um, for its radar. It has a high frequency radar at nine megahertz that can penetrate more deeply into the ice shell. And so it, that is the one, that's the frequency that will be used to try to get at determining where that ice ocean interface is. 
It also uses a very high frequency, 60 megahertz, uh, to probe the, the, the um, shallower ice shell. It also uses um, reflectometry and altimetry uh, to get at the um, tidal forces and bulging. Um, and then also just um, interrogating the ice shell for fractures and water pockets. So if we were to lay the fields of view of each of these uh, remote sensing instruments upon each other, we can I can show you here how they're, they kind of nest within one another. So the along track direction is going from left to right or, or right to left either way. But if we're going say from left to right here, um, the um, along track is in that direction and the cross track would be in perpendicular. So the along track um, and cross track fields of view are shown here. So the gray box is the field of view of reason out at 60 degrees. And then the, ne the nested one inside of that is the ice whack, which has a 48 degree by 24 degree um, field of view. And then inside of that is the Europa UVS field of view here in yellow or gold. And then the um, E themis um, field of view is more like a, a line and it can be a long track as far along as, as uh, the observation is performed at. Then within there is the MISE field of view here in red and uh, the innermost being the NAC, the ice NAC. And the resolution of each of these um, um, observations is shown here for a altitude of 100 kilometers. So at 100 kilometers, UVS will get 35 meters per pixel. WAC will get 22 meters per pixel. NAC will get one meter per pixel. MI is 25 meters and ETHEM is 20 meters per pixel. Okay, and then moving to the um, in situ investigations. So starting off with talking about, again, just a little bit of background about Europa's induced magnetic field. So the magnetic field um, allows us to really understand better the subsurface ocean to determine its location, thickness and conductivity and salinity if we can get compositional information as well. And then due to Jupiter's tilted dipole magnetic field, this allows us to get um, uh, information about the interiors over these moons because the, that tilted dipole uh, magnetic field induces eddy currents in the ocean, which, we can, be, which can be measured. It's also inducing a magnetic field at distinct periods. So it has an 11 period, an 85 hour period, and um, shorter harmonic periods. And we can use these distinct periods to also um, gather more information as can be shown here in the right uh, most figure where um, the blue line is showing the 11.2 hour period and the um, red line showing the 85.2 hour period. And using those measurements and induced field responses, um, this allows us to both get at ocean thickness and ocean conductivity, as well as um, uh, ice shell thickness. So the Europa Clipper magnetometer shown here is um, the instrument that will um, uh, focus in on um, uh, making observations of this type. Um, it'll help determine the location, thickness, and salinity of Europa's ocean. Um, it'll also characterize any active vents, plumes, and ionized plasma trails. And it'll help us understand the coupling of Europa to Jupiter's ionosphere, and then also coupling of plumes to, uh, to flowing plasma. So the instrument itself is a three flux gate magnetometer. So there's three of these flux gates um, on the end of the boom uh, here, and it's an eight and a half meter long boom. So it has to extend these, these, these sensors away from the spacecraft to, to prevent them from measuring anything that's being induced by the spacecraft. And so that's why you'll you know, almost always see magnetometers kind of stuck out on a boom way far away from the spacecraft. But um, these flux gates are what are taking the measurements. And um, we also have to do um, in-flight calibrations um, and uh, spacecraft rolls that require spacecraft rolls. Um, we have to do uh, about a roll on every third Europa encounter or several rolls on every third Europa encounter. Here's a, a, a actual piece of hardware that's being built. Um, we have these three flux gates and the interior, the model of the interior for how it works. 
the PIMS instrument, the plasma instrument, will also um, look at um, magnetic field. It's going to determine Europa's um, induced magnetic field response and help correct for any plasma contributions in order to estimate ocean salinity and thickness. So actually, the PIMS instrument and the Europa Clipper magnetometer will actually work uh, together to try to get at ocean salinity, ocean thickness. Um, they'll, uh, the PIMS instrument will also help understand the mechanisms of weathering and releasing material from Europa's surface into the atmosphere, and will help us understand how Europa influences its local space environment and Jupiter's magnetosphere. The plasma near Europa has a strong contribution to the observed magnetic field and masks the induction response from the subsurface ocean. And so this is an important reason why PIMS and, and Europa Clipper magnetometer work together to get at the question of salinity and ocean thickness and things. To the right here, you can see um, one of the sensors for the PIMS instrument. There's two of these on the spacecraft and each of them has um, two of these Faraday cups. And they're all, they're each positioned at 90 degrees to each other. These instruments measure the ion density, temperature and velocity, electron density and temperature. The sensors are, um, thankfully, these sensors are immune to the degradation and background noise from radiation. And so they're ideal for use um, in this environment. So speaking of Europa's radiation environment, uh, we there's a lot that we don't um, yet know about um, the radiation environment. Um, we have several models um, that can indicate to us which parts of Europa are more heavily bombarded by the radiation of Jupiter. Um, and yet we still don't, there's a lot we still don't understand. And even though um, the Juno mission has been there um, and is, is in the, the Jupiter system currently, um, it hasn't yet done um, very many flybys in this, this vicinity of where the Europa Clipper mission will be going. Um, however, it's very exciting because we do know that just recently the Juno mission has had an extended mission approved and they will be doing a, a few flybys of Europa. And so um, we're hoping that this, um, those flybys um, will get great pictures of, of, of Europa, but also help um, get uh, further information about the radiation environment that we can use um, in our models to, to further understand of how our spacecraft may be affected um, by the radiation there. So we do have a radiation monitor, which is uh, it's on the, like a, an engineering um, instrument um, and it's being built at the applied physics lab. And this will help us understand Europa's radiation environment and its effect of, on the surface of Europa. It's um, basically going to take these measurements using a charged monitor stack. And there's three plates here that are, that are of certain thicknesses and each of those plates provide a crude energy spectra. So each plate um, makes um, observations or has impacts that, that, um, of energy on their surfaces and this energy absorbed then translates to the energy transmitted. These instruments um, um, are used in combination with uh, dosimeters, which we have about eight of dosimeters um, shown down here in the bottom right. We have about eight of those distributed around the spacecraft, plus also hosted inside of inst uh, science instruments. And each of those will return integrated radiation flux above an energy determined by local shielding. So we will use these um, to measure um, the radiation that's being experienced by both the spacecraft and the instruments during the mission. And these instruments are building off of heritage of uh, Van Allen probe radiation monitor. The gravity and radio science investigations will really help us understand um, Europa's structure and any time varying gravitational tides that are occurring um, at Europa. It will help confirm the existence of the subsurface ocean and it'll help constrain the ice shell thickness. So basically the gravity science investigation uses the, the transmission of signals back to earth and, and uploading from earth to understand how, how the spacecraft's trajectory changes as it passes by Europa. And based on those trajectory changes, um, it can tell, about, tell things about what the, the density and what the materials are within the, um, the moon and the thicknesses of those materials. So it uses three fixed fan beam antennas plus two low gain antennas to fill in the coverage um, that it needs during those flybys. And here you can see the field of views of those um, different um, uh, antennas. 
It also uses the high gain antenna, which is a big circle here in the middle for occultations and IO plasma torus measurements. And that's the plasma that's kind of following along with, with IO in its, in its orbit. And it, it passes the transmission of the signal through that to, to basically calibrate um, um, that plasma um, effect um, out from its, from its transmission um, observations. And the, the radio science receivers use the deep space network for transmission and will also um, potentially be in use um, some uh, Europa, Europa, sorry, Europa, Europe, European Space Agency antennas. Um, and this is a non-intrusive um, investigation with a suite of science instruments. So it's, it's not competing with any of the science investigations um, and uh, can be used at any time. So the Europa atmosphere is, is really not much of an atmosphere when you think about like Earth's atmosphere. It's, it's more of an ion, you know, ionosphere where an exosphere, very, um, a very low on density of material. But there are materials there. There's abundant species of water, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. There's also likely organic compounds. And so it's going to be really interesting for us to try to um, characterize the distribution of these volatiles in any key organic compounds. Um, high mass resolution um, data of these measurements will enable us to get at individual fragmented ions generated by ele electron impact ionization. So as the, the, the high radiation and high energy particles are impacting the surface of Europa, we can, can make measurements of the particles that come back off. And um, measuring low abundances requires extensive contamination control of our spacecraft. So when you think about um, these in situ instruments that are collecting these particles as we fly by Europa, if there's any particles coming off of our spacecraft that we're maybe we haven't well characterized that, you know, quote, contamination, we may, you know, we don't want to be measuring things that are coming off the spacecraft. We want to be measuring the materials that are at Europa. And so it's really important to keep our spacecraft clean and not be worried about materials coming off the spacecraft, which is, it can be challenging when we're in this high radiation environment. But we've been working to characterize any outgassy materials. So the, the instrument that will really focus in on doing these measurements is the mass spectrometer and uh, mass specs. And it's um, going to help determine the distribution of these major volatiles and any key organic compounds in Europa's exosphere and any plumes that we come across. It'll also determine the relative abundances of key compounds to constrain the chemical conditions of Europa's ocean. It uses a multi-bounce time of flight mass spectrometer. And so you can see this, this uh, picture here, sorry. Uh, of uh, the mass spectrometer. And inside there is where the particles will bounce around and the time of flight will be recorded and that will help determine what the particles are made of. And um, it also uses um, region of interest scanning for high resolution over a broad mass range. And that mass range again is these, this mass range here where we're looking to see what mass range are we getting um, indications of materials and that will tell us um, what uh, composition of materials we're looking at, making observations of. The mass specs also has a cryo trap that allows it to, to capture material, keep it at really cold temperatures, and then wait for the spacecraft to get back out at periapsis where, or at apoapsis where it um, does uh, the measurement then in the, the low radiation environment, like outside of Jupiter's high radiation. <clears throat> Also of interest is Europa's cosmic dust environment. So there's also a lot of dust material that's being um, um, uh, impacted. So the surface of Europa is impacted by micrometeorites and it kicks up a lot of dust. And that material floats around uh, for a little while before settling back down. And this material can be sampled. And so the dust particles are expected to be about 0.5 to one micrometer in size. They're ejected by these hypervelocity impacts of micrometeorites. And um, the distribution is near isotropic with no strong temporal variations um, that's been measured so far. And so um, some variations are due to the orbital motion of Io and also Io has those volcanoes that are periodically going off. And so that material is not a constant flux. It's, it's um, you know, uh, kind of stochastic in nature. And so the ejecta um, is uh, off the surface combined with material that's coming in exogenically uh, can be measured. And it's uh, a process of trying to understand what's endogenic versus exogenic. Um, but the measurements will look for salts, salt hydrates, complex organic species, and silicates of exogenic and endogenic origin. 
So the main instrument that will go after this information is the SUDA instrument. It'll map the surface composition of Europa. It'll characterize the alteration of Europa's surface uh, compared to the exogen exogenous dust. And it'll also determine the composition of the particle matter in, ex in active plumes. So here on the right, we can see some pictures of real hardware being built. Here we have the, the schematic of how it works. It has an incoming particle that passes through and bounces back into the, the sensor in the middle. And here that um, particular cup and detector is, is shown here at the right. Um, we also have a sensor head lab prototype and the iridium coated target. Uh, it's a time of flight mass spectrometer and the composition of the particles ejected from the surface can be correlated with the geologic features. So they're actually very interested in collecting material over certain geologic features because then we can use the information about that material to help us understand how those features on the surface were formed. It'll also look for trace amounts of complex organics and they could be detected um, in ice grains um, at better than 0.1 parts per million. So here's just a, a, another picture of some of our uh, fantastic hardware being built um, for Europa Clipper, um, where you can see the MISE flight Dyson calcium fluoride lens here for the MISE instrument. We have an eThemis flight model telescope housing, the PIMS flight controller assembly, the SUDA engineering model dust in the dust chamber, an ECM pathfinder, that's the, the um, little sensor for the ECM for the magnetometer, uh, Europa UVS flight model housing, the ICE NAC engineering model, the mass specs engineering model here. And then um, here is the deployment of the reason very high frequency prototype. So I'll play this a little quick, real quick. So it actually just uh, releases and springs outwards. So how will we fit all of these instruments on our payload? We have a lot of fantastic instruments and we've got to get them all to fit and we want them all, most all of the instruments looking in the same direction. And in this way, we don't have to sort of make decisions about who's going to get to make, you know, which, which investigation gets to make an uh, observation that, that pass. Um, and so by having all of these instruments looking that, that need to be looking, uh, look in a certain direction, um, it allows us to, to both, um, you know, not have to, to worry about resources as much and be able to also get multiple types of observations at um, you know the same places on the on the surface of Europa and this will really help us um, you know just get at these questions that we have about how features are formed what's the habitability of Europa um, you know what's the composition um, and how all those different pieces fit together to get um, at the answers of our science questions um, the Europa Clipper spacecraft shown here at the left is um, we're being um, powered by solar panels. We have five panels on both on each side of the of the spacecraft. That's about five panels is about the the length of a basketball court, and so they're pretty big. Um, and they out they fold outwards. You know, once we're once we after we've launched, um, and um, we have also this three meter body fixed high gain antenna. Again, we have an eight and a half meter clipper magnetometer deployable boom. It's a spring deployment, so it just uh, coiled and springs outwards with the three flux gate sensors out at the ends. We have reason high frequency uh, antennas. So these, there's one on this side and one on the opposite side. And we have four of the very high frequency radar antennas, which can be seen here. And that's what the little video deployment was that you saw. And then we have the in situ instrument deck here, which is pointed RAM during flybys, and then the remote sensing instrument deck, which is pointed Nader during flybys. The Nader is just pointing down at the surface as we do our flybys. So currently, um, our, our most recent um, uh, trajectory, we do trajectory assessments like periodically during our mission development. And the most recent um, trajectory assessment that we've done is a, a Mars Earth gravity assist. So this trajectory has us launching in October of 2024 and doing a flyby of Mars, then swinging back and doing a flyby of, of Earth and then swinging um, out all the way to Jupiter. And this time of flight will be about five and a half years to get us uh, out to Jupiter. One thing that's really great too for our spacecraft for this type of trajectory is that we will only have to go in towards the sun as close as 0.82 AU. 
And so this is much more favorable for our thermal design because when you think about designing um, your instruments and your spacecraft uh, to survive out at the really cold temperatures of these outer worlds, um, to have to also survive when you going closer into the sun is very challenging. So by not having to go as close in to the sun, it's very helpful. The Europa Clipper mission um, will do about uh, 40 flybys. And I apologize, I can't, um, okay, now I can. Okay, so um, it has about a three and a half year prime tour and has uh, more than 40 flybys. And during this time, we have a maximum of four mega, mega rads for our radiation dosage. And so you'll see that we don't actually get up to this level during our prime mission, which allows us for some flexibility for a potential extended mission. But as we do the flybys, as the video shows you the flybys, you'll see the colors change and that'll indicate at what level um, radiation um, we've gotten to. And so we're doing multiple flybys or swinging and getting closer and closer. And then we start to do multiple flybys of Europa, you can see here. Okay, and so it starts, to, it does, you know, uh, rotate around with time and it moves a little bit, but it's mostly kind of going in the, the same spot. And at, during the beginning half of our mission, we're flying on the anti-Jovian hemisphere. So we're gonna fly on the anti-Jovian first, and then we change, we're doing a change here to go around and switch to doing flybys of the sub-Jovian side. So the sub-Jovian side is slightly more challenging. It's more, uh, more radiation there. Um, and so that's, we'll do the, the uh, anti-Jovian first, then switch over to doing the, the sub-Jovian. And then we'll complete um, our you know, 45-ish or so flybys and um, end the prime mission. So the, the strategy for operations of our mission is to do simple, repeatable operations. So we want, we, we've set up this structure such that we have similar observations um, being done for every flyby so that it's simple and repeatable. There is flexibility, of course, in there for um, plume observations that are, are more uh, further out looking uh, across the limb for plumes um, or stellar occultations and things that, that can happen uh, further out from the flybys, but the flybys themselves are fairly fast and um, need to be simple and repeatable. And so by doing this, um, we really simplify operations and, and can um, um, you know, have the quicker flybys as we need. So flybys will occur about every 21 to 14 days, um, starting out with the longer flyby period, uh, the, the longer period between flybys, um, so that we can, um, you know, get our feet under us as we start to um, uh, orbit uh, Europa or orbiting Jupiter, doing flybys of Europa, and understand better the environment that we're having to, um, to uh, function within. And so the, the way that it work, works here is that the closest um, approach minus two days begins our encounter, what we call an encounter. So two days out from passing our closest approach um, begins our encounter. We approach Europa. Um, when we turn the spacecraft and all the instruments point in nadir, we pass our closest approach um, and then we have our departure. And then um, as we depart, we're also doing um, a couple engineering activities such as reaction wheel, um, biases, um, and then um, uh, orbital maneuvers to keep our orbit uh, where we want um, to pass um, Europa for the next, next round. And so um, we also do calibrations at certain points. And um, also here is denoted the um, mass specs cryoanalysis. And that's where I mentioned that mass specs can hold on to a sample that it collects at Europa and then process it um, out of Apogee. So um, it's out of the, um, the high radiation environment. And during this time, we will play back um, the data. Um, the current mission uh, design consists of more than 40 of these low altitude flybys and has a duration of about three and a half years. Um, here's showing a map of the um, ground tracks. So, and the, uh, the colors denote how close um, the, the spacecraft is as it passes over this region of Europa's surface. So you can see here that the 180 um, uh, degrees west longitude indicates we're on the anti-Jovian hemisphere. And then we do a switch and we start to fly over the, the zero um, point, which is the sub-Jovian point, and we do um, flybys across um, that uh, hemisphere. We will range in altitude from uh, 400, the highest from like 1,000 to 400. This is when we start to show the ground check here. Um, some instruments can make observations from higher um, altitudes, but from 400 or from 1,000 down to 400 and switching um, to green as we get down to 100, 
um, then going to um, 50 uh, to 100 uh, kilometers, and then uh, 50 down to 25 being um, the closest that we ever get to the surface is about 25 kilometers. <clears throat> So how will we return all of this fantastic data? Well, we're gonna get a lot of really great data and we have to have a way of, of considering how best to get that all returned. So we have a way of um, sort of prioritizing the data and these are all decisions that are really made um, um, based on a few factors. One of them um, is being this decisional data of the highest priority. So any kind of data that an instrument really needs back very quickly to assess, you know, it, how well is, is the instrument functioning? Um, is it, is there anything that needs to be changed with the operations so that the next time, the next flyby, um, it will, it'll be able to do a better observation. Um, you know, this will be very important, especially in the very first few flybys as we really understand how the radiation is affecting um, the instruments. Then we move to um, encounters um, where um, the volume of the data that's being downlinked is valuable to get before back before the next encounter. And so this, this data is prioritized to be returned before the next encounter. Um, then we have the mission level data, which is only downlinked, um, just said, oh, as long as we get this back before the end of mission, we'll be happy. And then opportunistic data is downlinked as if, if time is available. So it's put and it's stored, but only downlinked if there's opportunity to do so. Now, really a lot of the decisions about what is needed um, down for encounters is really um, tried to be um, done uh, from the science perspective. So. We, we're, we're attempting to move away from, you know, my instrument and I want my data to what does the team need? What, what do we need? What kinds of data do we need to answer our science questions? You know, we, we need really a lot of different types of data oftentimes to really answer the questions that we're after. And so by prioritizing the data um, based on our science and our science questions rather than one particular type of science is really um, the, the overall one team philosophy to get at um, the best science possible to get this mission to return the best science possible. So this, this image shows you our web of flybys, as we like to call it. Um, and so with similar coloring, just that the highest um, altitudes are shown in white rather than black. And um, really shows you, you know, how we're really getting mostly at the subjovian and anti-jovian hemispheres, not so much the leading and trailing hemispheres, um, but these two regions of Europa, but still actually um, when you look at the maps of coverage by our different instruments, you'll see that especially, you know, for the cameras, the cameras are going to get at 80% or better um, coverage of the surface because they really can, with that knack, with that narrow angle camera, it can get great images still from pretty far away. Um, Reason gets great coverage over the ground tracks of the subsurface. Um, Ethemus gets a potentially almost global coverage for day and night coverage. Europa UVS, which is getting at... Um, uh, potential um, plumes and, and um, different, um, you know, compositions gets uh, pretty full coverage as well as MISE, which again is getting um, compositional data across the surface of Europa. Okay, so this next animation is going to take you on a ride on Clipper. So we're going to fly into Europa. We're going to look at which instruments are being turned off when and making different observations. We'll see here in the upper left what the altitude of our spacecraft is as we fly by Europa. And um, you'll see the flyby speed as well. And then you can also see in the bottom right where we are in um, Europa's orbit um, or as we're flying by Europa and Jupiter around Jupiter. So I'll just uh, get this started and I'll talk to you a little bit as we're going by. So you'll see the spacecraft maneuver a few times as it adjusts. A lot of times it has to adjust for what's best for the solar panels. And so it does then a rotation to get now in, in um, line for the instruments to make observations of Europa. So it's taking some observations from far away. Most of these observations um, can be done without uh, spacecraft maneuvers, but then you'll see a few that do require the spacecraft to turn and do uh, scans. So imaging, another spacecraft rotation. Uh, the orange there is the ice, uh, or sorry, Ethemus taking full global imaging. There's a full spacecraft uh, scan. So it actually rotates the spacecraft. Coming in, doing some imaging.
So now things will start to move more quickly. You'll see as we get closer and closer to the surface, take a lot more observations, rotation of the solar panels, they rotate and then they stay still for the final encounter period. Uh, so reason can take its data because reason again is on the solar panels. Okay, so quickly go by Europa, taking lots of fantastic data, doing more on the way out. Okay, and then um, here are some images also of the spacecraft hardware that's being um, completed, completed as we speak. We have um, a fantastic high gain antenna um, being produced here. The Nader deck is being machined where all the instruments will be attached. We have the stacked propulsion cylinders, which I think are undergoing uh, testing right now at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Just a lot of fantastic hardware coming to fruition uh, as we move closer and closer to launch. This is, you know, a little nostalgic. It's our last in-person um, uh, planetary science group meeting uh, that was held at JPL in February of 2020. Um, we have a strong team of a diverse group of people, engineers and scientists who've all come together to make this mission possible. Uh, you'll see here in the center, our special guest of honor at every one of our meetings. Uh, we have a monolith that um, participates in every one of our meetings, um, just a nostalgic uh, Europa symbol. So I encourage you to go to the europa-nasa.gov website to find out more about the Clipper mission, but I'm not gonna quite stop here. I'm gonna take us even further, what could be to come after Europa Clipper. So in the future, we also hope that we will go and land on the surface of Europa. I've been participating in a, in a Europa lander mission concept study where we've been investigating uh, what we could do to really interrogate the surface, take samples, interrogate those samples and look for signs of life. So the mission concept here is that we would land, we would collect at least three samples of about seven milliliters each, and we would perform analyses on those looking for biosignatures. We'd also perform geophysical and visual observations to get at the contextual information and further determine how habitable Europa is. So you can see here um, the product of the science definition team um, where we scoped out uh, different instruments that would get at these, these high level goals for really assessing both signs of life, how habitable Europa is at the landed scale, at the, the near subsurface and uh, context uh, for that information. So we have a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, a microscope, a Raman spectrometer, and context cameras to get at signs of life. And then adding to that um, set, we would add a seismic package for getting at habitability and contextual information. I can encourage you to go to this website here to get more information where there was a, a really uh, a great SDT report um, that goes through all of the, the um, the background and reasoning for coming up with the, the instrument suite, as well as the goals of the mission, and also goes into a lot of the engineering details, including how exactly we would land. So I hope a, a lot of you saw the Perseverance landing, landing recently, where we got to actually see a lot of fantastic imagery of the actual um, sky crane as it lowered the Perseverance rover down. And the Europa lander mission would be a very similar concept. We wouldn't need a parachute. There's no atmosphere on the surface of Europa. and at the surface or in the region of Europa, um, and which actually kind of simplifies things a little because we don't have to worry about wind blowing us around at all. Um, we just come in um, to land with our, our thrusters on and we lower, get lower down to touch down softly um, on the surface of Europa. And this is uh, an image here showing how um, the concept uh, goes about thinking about how we would cut into this hard, right? This, this ice is very cold. It's almost like rock. And you're cutting into that subsurface and scooping up sample and bringing it in for, for scientific analysis. I've also then been participating in, I also previously participated in a study thinking about how we could send a cryobot down through the ice shell of Europa reaching the ocean. Um, and so the technical objective of this type of mission would be to reach the ocean or a subsurface water pocket or a lake um, that we could reach maybe in the, the range of four kilometers or so below the surface. So in studying this, um, we also came up with several um, scientific goals very similar to the Europa Lander science definition team report where we would look for evidence of life, assess the habitability in situ in the ice shell as well as the ocean once we reach the ocean and characterize the surface and subsurface properties. And so um, following on from that study, um, I was funded to um, lead a team to uh, think about 
an important part of this mission is uh, getting back our you know, very important scientific uh, data. So as we um, think about how to transmit that data back up, we either think about um, a, an optical tether or even uh, free space repeaters that, that could send out um, radio frequency uh, into the, through the ice such that if the tether might break, you could still have a way of transmitting data. Um, so the, the Europa STI team, the signals through the ice team is the team that I've been leading looking at this. And we've actually frozen in tethers um, into blocks of ice and then sheared them along these dotted um, lines here. And so the rig will come down and push that central block in one direction with the tether frozen in inside and uh, shears the tether then along the dotted lines. And these tethers have been used previously. These are the types of tethers that have been used with submersibles and polar expo exploration of the oceans. And so um, they're, they're pretty hardy tethers, um, but we really didn't expect them to be as hardy as they turned out to be. Our results really, we did see some damage um, for these tethers, but it was mostly actually only on the, the jackets of the tethers and the, the tether itself only lost um, less than a 0.1 decibels of, of signal. So this was like really fantastic, interesting um, data. There's further um, tests that we need to do on these tethers, um, but it's very encouraging for them as a possible um, mechanism for, for uh, technology for sending signals um, back from a cryobot. We also did some modeling in this work to understand what exactly faults might be like on Europa, what kinds of, of shear uh, forces and, and strain would it in place if you had the cryobot pass across one of these faults and then have a fault slip occur after passing across there. Another way that we can think about trying to get at these questions before our missions arrive is, is doing field work. Um, and so we can think about um, investigating habitability um, and also how thing, these things work, right? So um, when we go to the sea ice of Antarctica, this is frozen ice on top of ocean water. We could think of this as a potential analog for a, type, a place like Europa. So we take ice cores of the, of the ice and um, interrogate the ice then for looking for microbes. You know, are there places where they're in greater abundance in the ice shell? And also, um, are there other confounding chemistries in this environment that might, um, you know, challenge our analyses techniques? And then um, thinking about geysers and plumes at um, places like Europa potentially or Enceladus, these um, um, mechanisms, this, 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 this uh, activity, it's really interesting, right? Because, you know, we all think about ice and water. Like if you throw your ice cube into your water glass, I mean, what's gonna happen? That ice will float, right? The ice is less dense than the water. So what really could drive water up through an ice shell? Well, if you have a drink this evening, you know, I'm, I've been drinking a lot of my bubbly waters lately and I open it up and what happens? I release the carbon dioxide from my, my drink and that water, that bubbly water helps bring material to the surface. I mean, if I shook the can up, that would really bring material to the surface, right? So we've gone out and explored um, some geysers in Utah, which are cold geysers, and they're just driven by the carbon dioxide that's being released, and it drives the geyser upwards. So we think about these things, and we try to understand how these worlds work, and these are some studies we can do here before our missions arrive. So just like to leave you with, with Onward to Europa, a great, um, exciting uh, mission. Uh, the Clipper mission will really help us assess Europa's habitability. Um, someday in the future, we'd like to land there, really interrogate the moon for signs of life. And then even further in the future, getting down into that ice shell, getting down into the ocean uh, beneath the ice shell at Europa, Fantastic discoveries really await, I believe, there and other ocean worlds um, like Europa. So thank you for your time, and I'll happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this very uh, detailed, as I requested, look at uh, this mission and its many complex parts. And uh, we have time for the Q&A session now, and so let's start with uh, a longtime PSW member and uh, Professor Emeritus from the NIH, Carl Merrill. Carl? Hi, thank you, Larry. Um, you know, since you showed that photograph of the group, and in the photograph is the slab, it begs the question that um, in, in one of the series of movies made about 2001, 2010, there was a warning there, and it said, um, all of these worlds are yours except Europa, attempt no landing there. 
So I wondered about your comment about that. But also there was another film um, made later, or I'm not sure, in 2013 called The Europa Report. Yes. And in a way that was somewhat present because it, it ended up in disaster if you watched it. In fact, the, the craft may have fallen over. And that brings up a, a real question. From what I understand, the, the gravity effects of Jupiter is such that the, the, the surface shifts 10 meters or so each day. So when you survey for a landing site, I, it seems almost incomprehensible how you can handle that without the whatever it is getting destroyed or falling over, as occurred in that fictional film, Europa. Um, and and so and then one last question: Seth Lloyd at MIT uh, gave a lecture about life deep in the ocean. And he pointed out that there actually is photosynthesis where it's almost pitch dark because, in fact, you have those thermal vents, as you pointed out, and they they give off black body radiation. And so you have a Gaussian distribution. So there are some visible photons of light. And he claimed that there's some evidence that there are creatures down there that can capture those few photons. So I wondered if you could comment on that. Thank you. It was a wonderful lecture, and I love the illustrations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so I'll start with the first one about the monolith. And um, we actually, I not myself, but I believe it was our project scientist, has gotten the blessing from the author uh, of those uh, books and, and movies that gave Clipper actually the, the blessing and the allowance to visit Europa. Uh, so hopefully we won't um, run into any issues. Um, secondly, um, the tidal forces. Yes, so you're right. So um, at the places of max bulging, there could be up to about 15 meters of bulging activity. It does somewhat depend on the thickness of the ice shell, um, but but at those locations, and that will be um, the subjovian and anti-jovian um, uh, locations on the surface. So at, as you move away from those locations, there's less of that um, bulging um, motion, and so. Um, it's, it's still unlikely that it would cause any um, too much of uh, perturbations unless the ice shell is, is thin there and you have water, that's the hazard, right, of, of, of potentially um, coming to the surface and causing um, uh, disruption of the surface that your, your lander might be sitting on. Um, but yeah, it could be a, a concern, um, but, but it can be considered. And this Europa Clipper will actually get very good measurements of this tidal motion and help to assess where our safe landing sites would be. Um, and then lastly, I, I actually wasn't aware of the, um, the organisms you said that have been uh, able to use the black body radiation. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and, but in the case for Europa, if that's the case, then those you know similar kinds of organisms there could potentially be doing the same thing, I would imagine. And and we do see organisms that we are able to measure sort of what they're what they're using for energy, and these are called chemosynthetic organisms that are um, at least the majority of their energy comes from the chemistry uh, that they're receiving from these vents. But maybe it's a combination. Um, but thank well you. One of the one of the other aspects, given the, what you just said, has to do with the fact that in that movie, the Europa Report, there are hints of bioluminescence, mm -hmm. and so of course that's evolved here on Earth. And so I wondered if anybody has thought about that and building that into your detection, or at least being aware of it, because you may see something like that, and if you're not aware of it, you might miss it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And that really gets right at, at trying to, to learn as much as we can about how life works here and where there might be conditions similar at the earth um, to conditions that we expect to be in these ocean worlds and thinking about how, how life that we know, I mean, a lot of what we search for is based on what we know. And we do try to think about things that could be different from what we know, but but based on what we know, we can do all these field studies and, and models and things to try to, to think and predict about the way, what kind of behaviors life might have if it's a similar type of life uh, for what we know. I have a question from YouTube viewer, Scott Matthews. He wants to know, how do you know the magnetic field comes from a salty ocean? Why not from the iron core? Hmm. Um, that's a good question, um, but I think it has to do, and this is not quite my field of expertise, but but um, it has to do, I think, with the amount of fluid that so the the signal strength 
has to do with that amount of fluid. And I believe the iron, the, the iron core is potentially believed to be solid iron uh, for Europa. And maybe that's part of the question, right? Is how do we know it's a, a fluid further out rather than a fluid um, more concentrated internally? But I think it has to do with the, the volume of fluid that would be needed um, to induce the signal that we see. And so um, the larger ocean um, could be the potential source for that. But it, yeah, I'm not actually sure. The, apologize, that's not my area. I have a question from Australia. Uh, PSW member Frank Robert. Frank? Hi, Kate. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, absolutely wonderful talk and brilliant uh, graphics. Really conveyed uh, what you were what you're after, which uh, we really appreciate because it's a very complex and fascinating subject. Um, just uh, quickly, uh, I don't know if uh, you have any possibility to uh, share uh, any data and testing uh, with the uh, ESA DLR triple mission concept, as they are in Antarctic testing of uh, a tunnel bot as well, as my understanding. Uh, and uh, it just seemed likely that uh, if you could uh, get around ITAR or the uh, the challenges of uh, the U.S., uh, that you could test design ideas that are not considered uh, uh, protected. I guess. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. I, I'm very interested to to talk more with folks on the Triple Project and um, think about collaborations that might be possible. Um, there are potential, you know, there's, there's p previous, you know, um, collaborations with folks. Um, so it should be something that's possible. I yeah, I sent your contact info. And okay. I think Christoph will probably be in touch. He was, Great. he was going to be on this call, but it's rather late and mm, yeah. where he is. So yeah. good idea, Larry. He may not have gotten yeah. on. It's so, also worth noting, if I'm not interrupting too much, uh, Kate, that uh, one of the uh, people who has been providing quality control feedback to the triple mission asked the question, um, are you focusing too much on microbes for your assumptions about life? And if something is actively looking back curiously, are you going to see it? So I, I thought you might. <laughs> well, and so kind of along those lines I've had, so I work a lot with a biologist at APL. When I came to APL, like my background really isn't in biology, but I've also been always been fascinated by thinking about astrobiology. And so when I started at APL, I teamed up with him and we've been working on these microfluidic sensors. And the question does come up for us, not quite about whether something's looking back at us, but on this, in the sense of like, we, we always think that we're going to this place that's gonna be the biomass levels there are gonna extremely low just because it's such a harsh, like extreme environment. But what happens if we get there and we actually are overwhelmed almost with the amount of biology that maybe we get lucky and we find a pocket of, of, you know, um, you know, a biofilm or, or something that it's almost like we'll be clogged, right? Is there the potential that we, we couldn't see the signal because there's too much of it. And so sometimes we do bat around that question and how we would try to address that, that challenge in our designs. Also very interested in your uh, test, and then I'll shut up after this. I promise, Larry. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the the testing of the uh, fracturing of the of the fiber. I'm sure that a you're aware that there's carbon nanotube dope fiber that handles uh, 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 bends much more readily than uh, the normal uh, mm. fiber that uh, is now being used in apartment buildings to turn little corners the way uh, copper can do. And two, that uh, 120 megahertz radio uh, is uh, a lack of absorption region for, as I understand it, for the cryo ice, such that uh, it might be a backup communication method with the uh, tunnel bot and it's the uh, sub it disgorges could be via that. But of course, then the problem is the water. Once you get the sub out free swimming in the water, how do you get the signal back? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been trying to use uh, uh, acoustic, but it's very, very low, either that or a super low frequency. Uh, like what's used to contact subs on Earth. Right. Yeah, great. Really all, yeah, all really interesting stuff too that we've been trying to look at some of the free space communication techniques too. And we've mostly been looking at the RF. Um, we had original plans to look at acoustic as well and never, hasn't, haven't gotten to that part of it yet. But um, yeah, because there's also could be fluid in the ice shell as well uh, that could confound some of our signals. So well, yeah, thank you. It's sort of a vaguely related question about, uh, you know, a penetrating probe. 
which is what are, what are the energetics of, of being able to melt through the ice if for even an optimistic estimate of how, how far you have to go. And I noticed that the Clipper doesn't have RTGs, it has solar panels. Mm -hmm. So um, it's obviously not the lander mission, but how would right. you see uh, powering a probe to get through the ice? Yeah, so so the most of the probes use the, the RTGs or some combination of of the radiogenic material to power it. And so it, it really is a melt bot um, for the most part, um, most of the studies and they have, there's all, there's a, a several studies out there that, that do look at the energetics of heat dissipation in the ice um, and how much energy you have to input to the tip of your, the front end of your cryobot to get it to melt. And actually the starting problem is, is pretty challenging because at the surface where you're, where you're in vacuum, Every, anything that you start to melt will immediately vaporize. And so how do you get to the point where you have enough pressure to where you get like a good contact and good heat transfer uh, at the tip to start melting like at a decent rate? And so um, people are tackling that by either starting with cutting rather than than melting and um, using lasers. Even people have been looking at using lasers to, to initially get into the ice and get a covering back behind it that they can get this good melting process going. But there's there's rates that people have been studying um, uh, and there's some chambers that have been built. I think uh, Bill Stone at um, Stone Aerospace has built a really tall chamber to, to test cryobots so that they can be in vacuum and have the ice at the right temperatures and um, melt um, things down, probes down through to test them. Yeah, so a lot yeah. of research. You're right. Yeah. Clipper doesn't. Clipper doesn't have any nuclear power. It's solar powered. They looked. It was a trade that we looked at um, earlier in the mission. Um, and um, most of the time with NASA missions, you really have to prove that you don't. You can't do it with solar before. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Just as a limited resource. Yeah. There's a public perception issue, and plus there's a very limited amount of plutonium at this yeah. point. Uh, I would take a. Voice question from Frederica Derema. Hi, uh, again, uh, like everybody, um, very exciting. And NASA always does this miraculous kind of um, efforts. And it was uh, really a nice overview of all that. I've been working a little bit myself. I'm, I was at the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the director, but I worked for many years with NASA. So I, um, so I had a question that was related to the one that was addressed regarding, you know, uh, analogs of life uh, in uh, in um, in Earth and oceans and and uh, so you address that. So let me ask an, another question. I had uh, um, a, so you talked about cryobots, but also how about coring? And also, I mean, this uh, the ice shelves there also can be in a sense developed over years, and maybe coring can in a sense uh, provide some uh, answer to the question about any potential life, you know. Um, much uh, kind of sooner maybe than uh, the cryobot mission. So. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, so for the Europa lander mission that would come first and, and really interrogate the near, near subsurface, um, mm -hmm. a, core, a coring device could be very informative. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't um, one of the instruments um, that was sort of planned um, by the science definition team. It's just like a study mm -hmm. that was done by a group of, of scientists and engineers. Um, but potentially that could be like a, a way of bringing sample into the, mm -hmm. the lander and getting at the stratigraphy, right, of, of your ice um, versus just um, a scoop of mixed up ice, um, you know. Um, so it could be a way of, of getting at like maybe potentially a meter or so depth um, of, of ice uh, to get sample that way first. And so the, I, the hope is, is that the lander mission uh, at the surface would come first and, and get more information, right, about what exactly is the composition. Like we get the, the we're going to get the uh, amazing spectrometry data, remote sensing data from Clipper. But then once you go below, just a little bit below the surface, is the material there diff a little bit, you know, very different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lander will really help us understand that also before we want to send a cryobot to melt all the way. Uh, yeah, because it may be something that you can discover very quickly whether there was life there, and that will be really fascinating, exciting. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, again, thanks for the great, great presentation. Yeah, thank you. Going to take a couple of questions from, uh, from YouTube. So uh, we have a question from YouTube viewer Ethan. He asks, with the extreme radiation from Jupiter, what materials in the ice shell 
an ocean can shield potential life. One would be the, and one would be the next favorable launch window for a follow-up to the surface. In other words, what's the window for sending a- For a land admission? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great questions. Um, so, so actually ice is actually a great protector for, from radiation. So we believe that you'd only have to, with the land admission, you'd only have to get, well, uh, we don't want to say we believe, but people have done models and, and assessments to understand how deep radiation can penetrate into the ice. And it's, it's um, seen to be about 10 centimeters or so. If you get below that depth, and especially also um, there are certain regions of Europa's uh, of surface that are more irradiated than other regions. So if you stay outside of the highly irradiated regions um, and you go below 10 centimeters or so of depth, you will get below um, the region uh, that's most irradiated and be able to really um, see signs of life there if they exist um, so that they haven't been degraded by that radiation at that depth. Um, and um, uh, the, the second question was uh, when the next um, favorable launch we, window, um, really we, uh, a lander could go anytime. Um, we do want it to, to go um, such that we would have information from Clipper um, transmitted back to the spacecraft. We could launch before having that information and, and be transmitted that information um, while we're in transit uh, to Jupiter. And um, it, it would be fantastic to send a lander sooner rather than later, because if there is any kind of current activity happening or we see a plume and we have a plume deposit that that's put down on the surface, you know, getting to that deposit as quickly as possible is really um, key because um, the longer it sits on the surface, the more um, radiation, you know, um, is, is occurring on it. So um, uh, the, the, the hope would be that we could send a mission very soon after Clipper, receive Clipper's um, data that tells us um, where the most scientifically interesting sites are, as well as, um, you know, safe uh, landing sites for a, for a landed mission. So I'll sneak a related question in there. So if you're looking for biosignatures and you're looking in say in a plume, as opposed to on the surface, what, what is the effect of the radiation on your ability to detect the biosignatures? So if you're looking for DNA and RNA, you're looking for proteins or amino acids, mm -hmm. how degraded will they get before you no longer can actually detect them? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, there's several things that can happen with collecting samples in a plume as you fly through. Um, it, you, in this environment, they could be irradiated if they're floating around out there for, for some period of time. Um, there are studies that look at um, how um, you know organisms, how hardy they are against radiation. Um, different organisms last for different lengths of time in those environments. Um, and then also as you fly through a plume, you know, your spacecraft is moving fairly quickly at a few kilometers per second usually. And um, the impact, right, of, of your material in whatever you're using to collect it, it can often um, actually cause uh, degradation also of your, of your material. And sometimes you can kind of parse out like what it was to start with and what it's, how it's been processed, but it's, but it's a little bit of, um, you know, people are, are doing experiments actually to try to understand that with these hypervelocity impact chambers where they shoot material at a plate and they look at what happens to it um, and, and any biosignatures in, in there. Um, they're actually, um, so this past week was the Lunar Planetary Science Conference and there was a, there a presentation on, on just that, experiments that are being done on this. Um, so, so if you were planning a mission to, to fly through a plume to try to look for biosignatures, you'd really have to, um, you know, have it going at the right speed depending on what device you're using for collection. Um, but then you would, you, you, you could um, bring in the sample in and, and usually all your instruments are, would be in a radiation, um, you know, shielded chamber in any case. And that would be the case for Europe and land admission. Um, you'd have to have things um, protected as you do your, your sample analyses. So I'll take a quick one from the, from the web and then we'll ask a, a question from Mr. Gamsler. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, what happened to it? Well, anyway, I'll just ask it. They want to know what the launch vehicle is and whether you're planning to use a Falcon Heavy or it's supposed to go on the SLS or... I think um, you need a pretty heavy lift vehicle. Right. So um, we will go, Europa Clipper will go on a commercial launch vehicle. At this time, it has not been decided what the vehicle will be. Uh, so there's actually a call out right now uh, for 
for a, a launch vehicle to be um, for for uh, industry and and folks to to propose um, uh, launch vehicles to be used for Clipper. So it doesn't need a, a Falcon Heavy class vehicle. Um, it would be along that yeah in that class of vehicles yeah. Uh, from Mr. Gansler, um, how long does it take to get data back, i.e. data travel time? Mm. And how is the mission ending? Will the spacecraft, and I think several people want to know about this, mm. what's going to happen to Europa Clipper when its mission ends? Are you going to crash it into Jupiter? Um, like uh, um, Galileo and Galileo, what am I thinking? Cassini and and um, yeah, Cassini went to Saturn. Yeah, Cassini crashed into Saturn. Yeah, it was it was a great ending. I believe actually the current plan, and and we and we've gone back between Jupiter and and Ganymede. I believe our our plan is actually to to crash onto Ganymede, and because it's it's known to have such a thick ice shell that it's not there's not concern for any um, planetary protection uh, concerns. Um, and was there another question? I was Data answered, Sorry. Yeah, I remember it was a data return. So I think yeah. it's about 90 minutes or so for if it's for a straight shot, like for, for a one way uh, signal. It's about an hour and a half. Yeah, I thought while you're on that subject, you could maybe say a few words about the deep space network and, and traffic on the deep space network and the plans to try to upgrade it and ideas for uh, a much higher bandwidth communications using laser beams. Basically. Oh, well, now you are getting a little bit out of my realm of, of knowledge. I know that um, we are thinking of using of a RAIN, the DSN network, uh, to try to help with communications um, and also uh, you know, taking advantage of the European Space Agency's um, radio antennas. Uh, but I'm not uh, actually sure about any uh, potential for the laser transmissions or anything like that. Yeah, there have been a, a few, NASA's done a few experiments to try and um, arrange for something like that because obviously you can carry a lot more data yeah. in a single. I mean, as, a, as a scientist, wow. more data would be fantastic. We will always take the ability to return more data because that is you know, a limiting factor for, especially for these outer planet missions is being uh, able to data. Thanks. We have a question from Al Ehrlich. Al, you want to unmute and ask your question? Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. We can hear okay. you. Thank you. Um, you, uh, you. You described very well and very interestingly the experiments that are designed to teach us about the surface and maybe below the surface of Europa. I, I wondered if there was going to be any, at least, post-experiment analyt analytics to try to figure out if what you're learning about what's going on on the surface teaches you something about the near, near Jupiter space environment, which is not exactly the focus of the mission, but. Uh, yes, I mean, so um, actually some of the, um, the instruments actually need to um, understand uh, some of the Jupiter space environment um, to kind of remove that signal, if you might say, you know, from the signal they're getting at Europa to try to understand um, what is, is coming from Jupiter compared to what is um, coming from Europa. And also it, they, they are doing comparisons um, of understanding how Europa affects the, the maybe more nominal Jupiter environment, um, right? So, um, the studies will uh, want to look at um, both environments as much as, as we can. Our focus is very much on Europa, um, but, but we will be doing um, you know, a bit of, of uh, science that's related to help us understand what's happening. Sort the... of opportunistic observations, which mm -hmm. not the focus. Thank you very much. Yes. I have a question from David Rabinowitz. Uh, David, can you unmute and ask your question? If not, I'll ask it for you. Uh, he wants to know what's the bit rate and power for the data downlink and how stable is Europa's orbit? How long has it been in its current orbit? 
So mm -hmm. take take them separately. What's the bit rate and power for the data downlink? I'm not actually sure what the what the the bit rate is. Um, I could find it in a slide uh, somewhere on my computer, but I'm I'm sorry, I don't know that number off the top of my head. Um, we can say it's relatively slow compared to like the fiber optic cable that runs yes. the oh, house. Yes. <laughs> a direct link, uh, yeah, a, a direct hardwire link would be much, much quicker. So yeah, they'll be slow. And then uh, you want to know about how stable is Europa's orbit and assuming it's not stable, how long has it been in its current orbit? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do believe that Europa's orbit has changed uh, throughout its history. Um, and we think that that has affected um, sort of its ice shell evolution. Uh, so we think about a, a cooling and thickening ice shell at Europa, but we do think that there were potential orbits that it was in previously that may have caused periods of warming as well as periods of, cool, of cooling. So um, I can't answer directly how long it's been in its current orbit. I don't think we understand that, but um, we do think it's gone through uh, different orbital parameters and, and periods of warming and cooling in its history. Interesting. I have a question from Mike Helton. Um, yes, so my question involves uh, flying through the plume, uh, a plume of uh, Europa. And uh, you talked uh, about that as if you were planning to actually do that. Uh, is there actually a mission plan to, uh, to attempt to target a plume and fly through it, um, perhaps towards the end of the mission. So if, if, if it does any damage to the spacecraft, uh, you won't hurt uh, too much data uh, that you're in, attempting to collect. Right, great question. And, and you kind of come really to the crux of it uh, in the end of your question, because uh, we do have like this, this set of goals, right? That we've, we've already done like extreme amounts of planning to make sure we get all the observations that will get at these, these large questions that we have about Europa. And uh, seeing a plume will be uh, extremely tantalizing. We will want to go towards it as quickly as possible. However, depending on where the plume is, it could require large amounts of our resources, right? To enable us to get uh, to that location, as well as you I mentioned, and potentially, um, you know, just um, causing some risk. Uh, so the plan is uh, currently to, you know, to stick to our original plan. Uh, and potentially, we may already just, you know, happenstance uh, to fly through the plume as our we are already our trajectory is already planned. Um, but if not, um, it's very likely that any plume material will uh, you know, make its way around Europa and in, in its in its in its um, environment there, and we could um, potentially do some sampling of it anyways. But the the plan is is to um, make plans to fly through any plumes in our in a hopefully um, extended mission. Um, so uh, we will have radiation dosage left. You know, we won't have reached our max radiation dosage, and so we're hopeful that we could um, act on any discoveries uh, in a, in an extended mission. Okay, thank you, and a very enlightening presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Tim Thomas. I think our next to the last question. Tim, you're on. You can, oh, he wants me to read it. Uh, determining habitability is, your, habitability is your stated mission objective. What exactly is that when you don't have any idea as what might be inhabiting Europa? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, of course, it somewhat depends on, on, on life as we know it, but, but really we, we understand, you know, life needs a few basic things, right? You need um, energy uh, to maybe keep this environment habitable. Um, you need um, something for it to eat. So a source of, of energy or composition of chemistry um, that is provide something for it to eat. And you need a fluid that enables like the, um, the mixing and the interchange of these chemistries uh, that we believe is necessary for, for life to put both, you know, kind of start and evolve. And so, you know, just based on that basic those basic things, we, we try not to predetermine um, necessarily like what exactly say salinity the ocean has to be at because potentially there could be an organism that can live in a salinity uh, much higher say than an organism here on earth could 
or we we try not to say um, it has to have uh, so amounts of carbon and nitrogen and and that sort of thing. But but we see that there is an abundance of chemistries that could support life. So you're right. I mean, it's it's hard. We're mostly um, basing um, how habitable we think Europa is based on life that we know. Um, but we do need to see those um, things there in a, you know what we would say is a, a decent amount of abundance or 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 um, habitable um, levels. Uh, for, for life, but it is based on mostly on life that we know. So I have a related comment. Uh, I imagine you've heard or seen Lee Cronin talk about his idea that if you detect a molecule of a, above a certain threshold complexity, mm -hmm. that it is only could only be produced by life. So, not really asking you to comment on that theory, but um, you have a mass spec. And yes. it, it's a mass spec that is the one required instrument to do that test. Right. Well, and, and this mass spec has extended its mass range over what the Cassini um, INMS instrument and the mass spec that they had in order to try to see more complex molecules. So uh, then that, was that could be one of your measures. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, the last question is nice question to end with. It's a question from uh, YouTube viewer, Beige Price. Kate, you explain complex concepts so clearly. Will you be a mission outreach spokesperson during the Europa Clipper mission? Um, yeah, I mean, all of us actually, uh, scientists on the mission are, you know, that's part of uh, most of us really enjoy, you know, speaking to the public. And of course, it's something that we find very, very exciting. The mission's very exciting. We, we, we take all the chances we can get to speak to the public. I speak to my kids' classrooms whenever I get a chance to inspire the, the next generations, right, or the very few down the line generations. Um, but, you know, um, uh, it's, I think all of us will be spokespeople and, um, as I'm on the project side, so maybe I will be a little, maybe a little bit more like, um, you know, talking about it. Um, but, but you'll hear about the instruments, you'll get to hear about their fan fantastic science that they're bringing home. Um, and, um, the pictures, uh, that we're going to get, uh, are just going to be fantastic. And we just can't wait to get there and be able to tell the public about all the amazing discoveries that we're going to, we're going to see, find. Well, we all thank you very, very much. You've been a splendid spokesperson. Thank and you. It's a terrific presentation. I hit all the notes I asked you to. <laughs> I tried to give you that detail. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I wish we could present you with our, our usual plaque and, and a signed copy of Volume 1 of the Bulletin, but I'll have to take a rain check on that for when you can come down and join us for dinner and the reception, yes. which you know you... You're welcome to do when we're meeting again in person. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I do, I do look forward to the opportunity oh, to come down sometime. Yeah. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank the you everyone. Of tonight's lecture will be available to everyone on the PSW Science YouTube channel. And due course on Vimeo and via the PSW Science website. Please share the links with your friends and subscribe to the channel for notifications on new postings. And do not hesitate to join it's easy to do using the join button on the PSW homepage website, website homepage actually. Before you go, we have a few important notes. There's been a change in the schedule. This next speaker was to have been Hod Lipson of Columbia University. Unfortunately, Hod will not be able to give the lecture as scheduled we have adjusted the schedule accordingly for now. There is some possibility that the date that he was going to lecture will have a different lecture, but not yet, and it's only three weeks away. So for now, we've adjusted the schedule as shown on this slide. But please check the website often for updated, up-to-date information. The next meeting as presently scheduled is number 2,438. It will be on April 23rd. The speakers will be Simon Bennett and Dan Irwin of the London Cross Whale Project. They will be speaking on the construction of the new Elizabeth Line subway, cutting underneath London, sometimes within an arm's length of its highest skyscrapers. 
The 2439th meeting will be on May 7th. The speaker will be Tony Tyson, distinguished professor of astronomy at University of California, Davis, and chief scientist at the Rubin Observatory, which is formerly known as the LSST. He will be speaking about the potential impacts of satellite constellations, like SpaceX's Starlink constellation, on astronomical observations and ways to mitigate them. The 2440th meeting will be on May 21st. The speaker will be Bill Powell of the State University of New York College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry. He will be speaking about the chestnut blight and approaches to bringing back a blight resistant American chestnut tree variety, including conventional and genetic engineering approaches. The 2,441st meeting will be on June 4th and will feature the annual Joseph Henry Lecture. The speaker will be Carlo Rovelli, director of the Quantum Gravity Group at the Center for Theoretical Physics in Marseille, France, and he will be speaking on quantum gravity. The 2,442nd meeting will be on June 18th and the speaker will be Steve Stitch, program manager of NASA's commercial crew program. He will be speaking on the commercial crew program and US manned spaceflight. Additional lectures will be posted in turn to the PSW website, www.pswscience.org. Please check there often for updates. And with that, last but not least, please join me in thanking tonight's crew for producing tonight's event, James Hillen, Ann McQueen, and Robin Taylor. Thank you all. And I will now adjourn the 2,437th meeting of the society. I wish everyone a good evening. The meeting is adjourned.